Well, tonight I'm going to, I want to talk to you about finding your purpose, finding your purpose. Okay. I don't want to talk to you about why you are here. Have you ever thought about that? Why are you here? That's a good question. Personally, you, why are you here on this planet, breathing his air, eating his food, drinking his water? Why are you here? Why does he have you here? Why were you created? What is your purpose? You realize there isn't anything that God has made that doesn't have a purpose. If that's a, if that's a de- double negative, I'm sorry. You want to hear some more bad English but good theology? <laughs> you want to hear some more? There ain't nothing here that ain't got a point is what I'm trying to make. Okay, that's the point. There ain't nothing here that doesn't have a point. Every single thing that God created has a reason, has a purpose. Every single atom, every molecule has a purpose. Space has a purpose. Matter has a purpose. Time has a purpose. Angels have a purpose. Demons have a purpose. Maggots have a purpose. Suckerfish have a purpose. Clouds have a purpose. The sun has a purpose. The moon has a purpose. The heavens has a purpose. Men have a purpose. Women, you have a purpose. It's extremely important that you know what you are in this day and why you were created the way that you were created and you embrace the purpose that the Almighty God made you for. Men, women, boys, girls, all of us. Fathers, you have a purpose. Mothers, you have a purpose. Marriage has a purpose. It has a design and it has a purpose. I have a purpose. You have a purpose. I hope you're getting it. This is my whole sermon. Okay? I have a purpose. You have a purpose. All God's children have purposes. We all have purposes. Now, I want to read you some different dictionaries definition for the word purpose. Listen to this. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. What is the reason that you exist? Why did God create you? What did he have in his mind and his heart? What were the good works that he prepared that he says before the foundations of the world that you could walk in all of those? What's the why behind all of those things that he prepared for you? It's extremely important that we know. The next definition, the original intent for the creation of the thing that was in mind of the creator of the thing. What was in the mind of the creator when he created Adam? What was his original intent? What was his original intent when he took that rib out of Adam's side and Adam wakes up and there's this beautiful bride walking towards him? What was his intent? So it is the reason for the creation of the thing. And it is the why for a thing. That's what the purpose is. So it's the why behind the what. Okay, here's a man. But why did you create him? What is the purpose? Dr. Miles Monroe says, the greatest question is not what, but why. He says, you must ask the maker of anything to determine the purpose for that thing. What are we? We're, we're asking anyone and everyone but the maker for the reason. We look in the mirror and we think, oh, this is where I get my significance from. This is where I get my identity from. This is, this is what makes a young lady valuable today. And we compare ourselves among ourselves. And we figure if we look this way and we're this tall or we're this weight or we're this or that, we have meaning and purpose and significance because we get people's attention or whatever the case may be. And God says, those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. 
So now we have a massive percentage of young ladies today that are comparing themselves among themselves and determining where you compare yourselves. You're either going to become prideful, or you're going to become apathetic, or you can become depressed. So we got, say, a third thinking about suicide, a third over here that are so prideful that they nauseate God because he's humble, right? And then the other half or other third walking in apathy. I'm just as good as that person or good in that person. And nobody's achieving, very possibly, nobody's achieving what they can, they don't even know why they're here other than comparing. And so we have a huge mess on our hands because we don't know why we're here. Shakespeare had a play, you know, and he had a man there, and he was, the man was full of sound and fury, right, signifying nothing. You remember a, a man making a lot of noise but not saying anything of meaning or doing anything that really mattered. Helen Keller was asked, is there anything worse than being blind? And this is what she said, oh yes, having sight without vision. If I could see with my eyes but have no vision for what I was going to live my life for and no purpose beyond what I could see with my eyes here, that would be way worse than me being blind physically but having this incredible vision for my life and what God created me for. That would be way worse, right? It was like when I had my truck and trailer and all this equipment stolen and stuff. I mean, I, it was bad. It was bad. I was, uh, I felt like I just got back kicked in the stomach. I'm just like, uh, uh. But like, dude, that's really bad. I'm like, hey, I would much rather be on this side than the, the dude that took all my stuff. I would much rather be on this side. Because from over here, I can pray for him. And I've been praying for him for 20 years. I never met the man, but I don't think. Maybe I have, maybe. <laughs> but I would much rather be on this side than the other side. And that's what she was saying. I would much rather be physically blind, but have vision than have no vision and be able to see. And Dr. Monroe says this, is there anything worse than death? Listen to what he says. Oh, yes. Living your life without purpose. That'd be way worse. Just stumbling around with no purpose. You don't know why you're here? Maybe you don't even care that you don't know. Someone says, you know, ask a, a young person in, in the school university, what's the worst problem that we have? Ap apathy or ignorance? It was a, I don't know, and I don't care. Just, we got both problems. So we need to know, we need to know, and we need to care that we need to know. We need to know, God, why did you create me? This is everything. I remember being 12 years old, laying out in my backyard, looking up the stars, just going twinkle, twinkle, little, what in the world? And I realized what they were, right? These are not just twinkle, twinkle. That's 30 trillion miles between the average, between two stars in our galaxy, and God flung them out by in, in space, and he knows every single one by name. And I'm thinking, wow, if the God that created all of these, and he knows every single one of them, he knows how many hairs are on my head or how many's not, I have to align myself with the purposes that he has in his mind when he created me. Otherwise, I don't care what I've accomplished or done. At the end, I'm a total, absolute failure. Because what did he create me for? My mother told me I was going to be preaching, and according to a lot of people's standards, I would be an absolute failure. But you know what? My mom knew that I was going to be a preacher before I ever was born. And I think the devil knew it. That's why I tried to root in me terror to get up in front of people. This is the number one thing. People would rather die than to get up and do what I'm doing right now. And I have no fear. The only reason I have no fear is because I'm not up here trying to entertain you I'm, I'm hoping to try to transform your life tonight, right? And so the purpose is I get lost in them. If I had to come up here and try to entertain you, I'd be freaking out because I'm not an entertainer, right? But if I get lost in what God wants me to say and know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't care if you like me or not, to be honest with you, because it's not where I get my identity from, right? I mean, it's nice to be liked. I mean, I don't just love to be hated, but if people reject me because of truth and it's done in a loving way, right, and it's animated by the Holy Spirit and I'm listening clearly to him and I say something, it's okay. It's okay if many reject me in this day. It's perfectly fine. If I'm serving my purpose and I'm doing what God has called me to do and we can all walk with our identity and security 
and joy if we have found what God created us to do. So listen, listen to what Dr. Miles Monroe says here in just a little bit. I want to just share a couple little things with you that he says around purpose. He says, if you don't know something's purpose, you will most likely misuse that thing or you will abuse it. And he talks about how the British language comes, uh, was the foundation for our English language. And so he talks about how we shorten things many times. Like we'll say, I'm not coming, I am not coming. And we'll just say, I ain't coming, right? And he talks about when someone in the British world speaks of abnormal use, in America, we've just changed it to, and we just drop the abnormal, right? We just go, abuse, abuse. So when anything is not used in the way in which it was created to be used, it's abuse. Not that the thing itself is bad, but that we're twisting the use of it, right? And now we're abusing it. So I would have to ask you a question. Does alcohol have a purpose? Paul told Timothy, take a little alcohol for your stomach. According to the Bible, I mean, I'll just tell you, the Nazarene church is, is teetotalers, right? They're like, no. But that's not what God's word says. It says that take a little alcohol for your stomach. Okay? If you, if you know NyQuil, cold, and flu, nighttime relief liquid contains 10% alcohol. And, I mean, it's helped me a few times, you know? Like, I'm like, ooh, I'm just not feeling, not feeling it, right? I'm like, babe, I got to get a little bit of sleep. Now, if I'm drinking the entire bottle and I'm wasted, we have a problem, right? <laughs> but if I take it the way that it's designed, that's not abuse. That, could, that can be, it has been helpful to me a few times in my life, right? I was le- uh, recently listening to someone talking about nicotine and how useful it was and saying how we've twisted this product and many people are smoking it instead of doing other things that nicotine can actually be good for you. And I was just recently talking to a, a pharmacist and she was telling me, oh yeah, as soon as I started talking about it, she's like, oh yeah, she starts just downloading the truck on me, you know, saying, oh yeah, they've added all these different things to make it addictive. And these are the things that are causing cancer and all this kind of stuff. But this specific product that God created does have a purpose. It's being abused and it's being twisted, but there is a purpose. God created the cocoa plants we get cocaine from. Maybe we don't know the purpose, but I know this, he created it. And there's a purpose. Now that we we may not know the purpose, and we may be twisting the purpose drastically, I believe we are, but everything that God created has a purpose. And you know what Satan loves to do? He loves to take everything that God creates. Matter of fact, all evil, listen carefully to me. You can't say, you know, the whole yin yang thing. Here's, here's good and here's evil and you need this even balance and all this kind of stuff. Hogwash. You have God created. This is life. Satan takes the designs of God and he goes over here and he monkeys with them. Just like if I went out and cut Tim's brake line in his car. I could almost leave the car exactly the same and everything would drive. He'd start that thing up and was driving around here and 18 wheelers coming down citrus and Tim starts to stop and brake fluid squirting everywhere and boom, it could cause death for him and his entire family because I changed the design just slightly of his car and I could get in prison for the rest of my life because I could do it with ill intent and they could prove that I cha- if they could prove that I changed the design of the vehicle with ill intent, right? I could be prosecuted for murder because I changed the design. That's what Satan does every single day to every single design that God has. He changes the design. He tries to hand it back to you, give you a different purpose and says, there, here, you, you know, and do that. That's the twistings, okay? So all evil is when we twist the design of something or use something in the wrong way or for the wrong purpose. So think about this for a moment. God has made us in his image. We are to be a reflection of God in character. He made us in his image. In other words, we have a mind we can think. God is a rational being. He can think. 
He can choose. He has chosen in all eternity, right? He's chosen. So he gives us a will so we can choose. And he feels. And we have the ability to feel. We're made in his image. Now, we may think evil thoughts. We may choose evil things and delights in those things. I mean, there are people so wicked that they don't even do the, the mass murder or whatever, and they want credit for it, right? Because they're so twisted. They want to say, oh, that was us, that was us. And they have no evidence it was them because it wasn't them, but they want to take credit for it. You can get really twisted. But that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to twist us so we're operating not by God's revelation to our rationale, right? Where we choose with our will to lock it around God's revelation and his truth. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So then when we choose the truth and trust in him, our emotions come in line. No matter how you feel. Today, what do you feel like? Do you feel like a, Mr. Alex, do you feel like a young lady or do you feel like a 70-year-old man? How do you feel, right? And whatever he feels, he gets to say, this is the new reality. I just, my feelings determine reality for the entire world. That's what he says, right? That's what the enemy says to us. Instead of truth, it's what truly corresponds to reality. What actually is. And God says, it's going to be so deceiving. Matter of fact, the first thing that he says when he says, hey, um, what's it going to be like at the end of the age? He says, beware that you are not deceived. That's the first thing. He's like, just sit down. Let me tell you the first warning. Be careful you're going to be deceived because it's going to be incredibly deceptive times. Matter of fact, it's going to be so deceptive that if it was, it was, if it was possible, the very elect would be deceived. Anyone, not just mildly kind of liking the truth, you have to love it and you have to cling to it. If you don't hold to it with every fiber of your being, you're going to have it stolen from you. That's what's going to happen. Because only those who love the truth and hold fast, buckle it around your waist, right? Not you know, like the cops pulling up and you're like, oh, hey, pull the seatbelt across. And you just kind of lay it across your stomach. Well, that might save you from a ticket, but that won't save you from going through the windshield, will it? Will it? Because it was never buckled. You can come to church and go along and act like you, you know, believe all this stuff. No, if you won't get in the wheelbarrow and go across on the tightrope, if you know that illustration, with the Lord, right? If you won't entrust yourself to him and you don't buckle the truth around your waist, it ain't going to save you. He says, in these deceptive days, you have to make sure you're clinging to the truth with every fiber of your being. Okay? So, Here's one of the crazy things is when God makes us in his image, he wants to make us in his likeness. His likeness is when we use our mind, our will, and our emotions the same way he does. So we think his thoughts, we choose righteousness, right? And then our emotions follow. If we switch everything on his head, what happens? Our emotions lead. Satan, we have a bad circumstance. Satan's over here monkeying with circumstances. We don't in everything give thanks and rejoice in everything and praise him and all this kind of stuff. We don't do that. What do we do? Our emotions are controlled by our circumstances. Satan's running the circumstances out here. And what happens? We start believing false things. Our will's broken down to do what we're told to do. And so we get in this, we get enslaved to lies and fear because everything has been flipped up on its head. Am I making sense to anybody? Yes? I would preach a lot better if you guys would talk back to me. But anyways, all right, this church doesn't do that. So <laughs> so Satan's goal, listen to this, is to make us in his image and in his likeness. I was made, I was, uh, I was made, I was, <laughs> in my mother's womb, my mom had the idea that I want to give him the name after a man who was made in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. His name was Stephen in the Bible. So he was the first martyr after Jesus laid his life down, praying for the very people that were killing him. She says, God, you've given me the son in, in my womb. What do you create him for? I know he's supposed to speak your word, but what kind of character is he supposed to have? And she believed that God was laying in her heart that he, he wanted me to have the same type of, type of character that she saw in this man in the Bible named Stephen. So she named me Stephen after the first martyr. Here's the crazy thing. I believe he's probably the only, the, pers the only person in the entire Bible that got a standing ovation from Jesus. Because every time you see Jesus, after, he's, after he raises from the dead, he's always seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. 
Always. Except one time. Stephen goes, they're stoning him, hitting him with rocks, right? And this guy is crying out. He sees the heavens open, right? And he says, he sees Jesus. What's he doing? He's standing at the right hand of the Father. He's like, that's my boy, that's my boy. Look at him, right? He's going, he's doing the exact same thing that I did on the cross. He is praying for the people that are killing him. He's not only in my image, has a will of mind and emotions. He's actually using all three in the exact way that I did, right? Pray for those who despitefully use you. Love pours out of you, right? So he's choosing with his mind to interact. He's being animated by God's love. He's not allowing, well, these people aren't treating you right. He's allowing his emotions, you know, circumstances control him. No, he's made in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's when God has sanctified us out. That's what happens. Christ literally has control of every part of your being, not just forgiving you for your sins, but he's taken over and he reigns and rules. He's not only your savior, but he's your what? He's your Lord. He's your boss. He's the one that runs your life. So he teaches you what to think. He, he empowers your will. He works in you both to desire to do his will and the power, gives you the power to do it. So that's what he does. So to think with me for a moment, what does Satan want to do? Take the whole thing and twist it on his head. He wants to make you in his image and in his likeness, right? And if I had time, I would just show you God's whole design, right? God designs angels. They're a little bit, they're, they're, they're here underneath God and man's a little bit a little beneath the angels, right? Then you look in the garden and God gave Adam and he gave Adam the authority over his wife. They're equal in, in value, but authority and that structure, the man is in charge. He has authority over her in a sense. He got to name her just like he named the animals. So he was responsible to care for her and to guide her. And so what happens? Then you see the animals and the plants. Satan comes. He doesn't come to Adam and say, hey, I want to tempt your wife. No, he comes around Adam, the authority, and he comes to Eve, and he brings this plant at the very bottom of the food chain. He comes into a serpent, right? And then he holds up this thing. Look, at this. It's beautiful, beautiful. And he appeals to her emotions. See, she sees that it's beautiful for fruit and good for food and all this kind of stuff. Then he starts question, questioning, did God really say, comes to her and tries to break down her will and, and starts lying to her. God didn't really say. And then pretty soon she gets to eat of it. And look what happens. The whole thing is flipped. Now the devil is cursed, right? And the whole thing gets flipped up on his head. Now what's life about? Saving the planet, which we should be good stewards of the planet. But now the whole thing has been flipped on his head. The whole thing. Satan is ruling at the top, right? Defaming the name of Christ. I know people that, that animals are so much more important to them than children because the, everything can just show you the whole system has been twisted upside down. But that's what he wants to do. So one of the saddest things in the world is that most of us, maybe and at least many, if not most of the people in the world today, in this generation, they have no idea what their purpose is. They don't really know. They're just trying to say, well, I want to get famous or I want to get powerful or I want to get, you know, or whatever, so many followers or whatever the case may be to find myself. What's a baby's purpose? We have no idea in our culture today. That's why we've killed an estimated 120 million since basically the day that I was born. Through chemical and surgical abortions, around 120 million children in our culture and we funded it around the world, hundreds of millions of dollars around the world. Listen to what Psalms 8 verse 2 says. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. God says, I want to shut Satan's mouth. And here's how I do it. You take any atheist and you bring a sit a little baby in his hands and this cooing little child, you're like, oh, that's amazing. I can't believe this thing evolved. That's incredible. If you're foolish enough to believe that, you have a thousand times more faith than I have. It's unbelievable. A circulatory system, a digestive system. I mean, it's crazy. 100,000 nerve endings going to the brain that all happens from your eyeball connect, connect perfectly. It's insane. It's unbelievable. 
And boom, he says, this shuts the devil's mouth, a little child. That's, the pur- that's one of the purposes God creates a beautiful little child for. But why is Satan running his trap so much? Because we don't know what babies are for, and so we just destroy them by the millions. And Satan's mouth just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? As we just keep offering more and more. It's really wild because in ecology, it's, it's, uh, we, have, we have killed animals, you know, that we don't know what they're for. Oh, these, aren't, these have no purpose, and we'll just pretty much wipe them out. And then they'll start freaking out, saying, whoa, 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 everything's getting off. Because we changed one little thing in the whole ecosystem, right? And so then they have to freak out and try to reserve this, this whole thing, and everybody's scrambling because this one little creature that we had, had no idea had a purpose, throwing off every single other thing because God in his infinite wisdom has a purpose and for every single thing. It's mind-blowing. So what's the government purpose? Besides giving us free phones and free health care and educating our children, we, we know all of that. We have to have that. But what is the purpose behind? <laughs> you guys, just help me out a little bit with a little laughter, okay. <laughs> so... What is the true purpose of government? God says that it is to punish wickedness and to reward righteousness. It's not to hand out the free phones. It's not to hand out education. The the government has no business educating my child, according to Scripture. The only time you see it is this, is when Nebuchadnezzar comes and gets right? And the people of God are incarcerated because of their disobedience. And they're given three years. We're going to re-educate you and tell you and train you in all the ways of the Babylonians, right? So I love what Vody Bakum says about that. He says, if you, if you send your children to the Romans or to Caesar, don't be surprised when they come back as Romans, Something to that effect, one way or the other. Okay, don't be surprised. So, the Bible says the heavens have a purpose. The heavens, what? Are to declare the glory of God. You know what scientists find out? They're like, oh, I think we find the furthest star. Wait, 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 wait. No, there's something out there, 50 million light years a little bit further out. And then, and they just keep, they're just constantly expanding. God says, you can't imagine, imagine how big I am. So if the heavens are, are not just for us to live in, so we don't bump our head on, you know, but they're to display God's glory and to declare every moment, I'm big and I'm bigger than you think I am. That's why it's ever expanding, right? Like my peace and my kingdom is it's just going to be and of its peace. My kingdom and of its peace, there shall be no end, just constantly expanding for all eternity. So, your hands have a purpose. It says, so work with your hands so that you have to give. He says, jump right over yourself, take these hands and say, God, these are your hands. What do you want me to use them for so that I can do something of purpose so that I can give to others? So very early, I've said, told my kids, it's the, the, the sooner you get a vision beyond yourself, the sooner God will start giving you more ideas that he will bless you more so that you can bless others more. If you're the end, that's very, very sad. But if you're five thinking about how could I give blankets to the cold, that those who are cold that are homeless, then I, I guarantee you God's probably not going to leave you cold at night. I bet if he gets it through you, he's probably going to get it to you. So it's extremely important that we have a vision beyond ourselves. So everything has a purpose. The Bible says even the wicked. You're a Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, dude, I'm the ruler of the world. And God allows him, if you read it, he allows Pharaoh seven times. It says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Seven's the number of completion. Then it got to a point where it says, maybe the scariest verse in the whole Bible. It says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He's like, what? God says, this is what you want? Are you sure you want this? Are you positive? This is your final answer. Seven times, bang, 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 bang. And I'm talking 
major things. You want to drink blood instead of water? And he goes in his, in his, in his castle and he's like, oh, come on, we can, we can do the same thing. And his little, you know, magicians come and pull a little stud and he's like, oh, see, I told you. And he hardens his heart after seven times. Then it says God hardened his heart over and over and over and over. But God says, listen, if you're determined to be my arch enemy on this planet, then I'm going to supercharge you, baby. Right? So he takes him over to the other side. He says, you're, gonna, you're not even going to be able to be a... That's what the devil is to me. So let me strengthen you. If you want to be my enemy, I'm going to make you so awesome and so hard-headed that you'll be an enemy that we'll be talking about for thousands of years. So it says that he raises him up to be a good enough enemy that the story will go for thousands and thousands and thousands. That's why we still know the story today. It's pretty wild. So listen to this. He says in Proverbs 16, verse four, the Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for a day of disaster. But what does that mean? That God predetermined this person's for judgment. No. I do not believe that for a moment. What does God say? He says, listen, you want to come to that point where you are living this way to me? He says, there's going to be a day that I'm going to make everything right. And I'm going to prove my justice by destroying all wickedness. And you're going to prove me righteous. Matter of fact, the most wicked being on the face of the earth is going to say, man, you are a just judge. I'm getting exactly what I deserve. And we're going to prove God's character, those that are wicked, by their righteous, by the righteous judgment of God. He says, you flipped to this side, and now your purposes are what? To prove me just on that day when I destroy all evil. So, everything has a purpose. You guys ready? Girls, I'm going to step on your toes for a minute. Move your toes back a little. Okay. Clothes have a purpose. You know who created the first clothes? Well, Adam and Eve tried. <laughs> I'm like, oh, the, little, the little fig, you know, or whatever, the little. But God slaughtered an animal and ultimately made them clothes. Why? He gave them clothes to cover themselves. Okay? Before, when God's presence was on them, they were covered in the Shekinah glory of God, I believe. They were, they were naked physically, but they were unashamed. Completely unashamed. But the moment, boom, they sin, God says, in the moment you sin, you shall surely die. And that separation of my spirit and you, guess what? There's going to come all these different forms of death. Now you're just existing. You're not living forever with me because you're detached from life. And in that moment, they go, oh, we're naked. Ah! Right? They realize something because that's the kind of glory of God. Is from. So God says, I'm going to clothe you. And clothes are made for a purpose. You know what they were made for? To conceal your body. You know what our culture has done? Is everybody listening? Our culture has taken clothing and turned it on its head, not to conceal, but to reveal. To reveal. And God says, I'm giving you this to conceal it. So that one woman, when she's in a lifelong covenant relationship with a man who's committed to die for her, then she can reveal herself to him and it's beautiful and it's righteous and it's incredible and it's my design. But outside of that, you should conceal your body and not reveal your body. So I remember somebody, and here we go. Um, if you don't like this, just throw it out or ask the Holy Spirit, okay? This is going to be Steve for a minute. And I don't know that I've ever done this before, but I do feel strongly about it. Paul says, I think this is from the Lord. <laughs> and, and I'm going to just stay, I'm going to make a preclaimer, okay? If this hits you right between the eyes, this is not to condemn you. It's to hopefully give you a little wisdom.
because, you know, we can just be part of our culture and not ever even have thought about it. Okay? But I remember when I was sitting in the school and I was making this point to the young ladies in the school. This is many, many, many years ago. One of my students came to me and said, you know, I never thought about it, but when, have you ever seen somebody, have you ever seen somebody that has a concealed weapon permit wearing spandex? Right? They've got a gun and they've got it in spandex. So you see this big gun sticking. <laughs> no. Is it because some things are made to reveal your body and some things are made to conceal your body, right? And so I would just ask you, I think there's different ways. Like what, if, what does Satan want to reveal? I think skin would be one thing that, that the devil would like to, he's always, you know, he's always, it's got to be shorter or this or that somewhere. There's got to be something showing, you know, it's got to be low cut or it's got to be up or it's got to be down or something. Or the other way is it's just to reveal every curve of your body to every single man. And you, they don't see your skin, but they see everything else basically. And I would just have to ask you, just listen, if it's wrong for a man to look upon a woman to lust after her, and if he does, he commits adultery within her heart, I think that from a love perspective, women should dress in a way that say, listen, I'm going to purposefully not try to make myself a temptation for all, every man so that I feel better about myself because my identity is that I'm turning all these heads. Well, if you're turning all those heads, you might be doing it for the wrong reason. And they might be sinning. So I would just say, ask God. God, give me wisdom in this area and help me. I love what Paul Washer says. He says, your clothing should be the frame for the face of God. So that when people see you, when they see you, they see the face of the Lord. So God talks to, to uh, specifically to women. So you're pick, are you picking on the women? No. But... Uh, I think men are more visually stimulated. Obviously, if you don't know that, I think that's, that's kind of a general statement. But uh, anyways, so he specifically says to women, you know, talks to them about modesty. And people have gone, I mean, in every ditch under the sun in this. Okay? I mean, if I told you some of the stuff that was taught to me, and I so rebelled, <laughs> I so rebelled because I said, you have lost your ever-flipping mind, <laughs> The craziness that was taught to me, I felt like. But God brought me back, I believe, to just a few wisdom points. And I try to share them with my, with my girls. Hey, listen, if you dress in a way that you get some guy's attention because of one thing, your body, then you're going to be in a constant competition for the rest of your life to keep his eyes. And if he's that way, you're going to lose him like that. And you're going to be fighting your whole life because that's what you've got. But if you, if you draw a man because of your inward beauty and your character and your relationship with Christ, now you have somebody. Now you got somebody. And if you're in a car wreck, he's probably still going to be there faithfully in the hospital serving you. And if you're drooling for the rest of your life, then you've got something. All right. Beat a dead horse and just keep going. Okay. I got no amen. So, all right. What is your Why? What is your why? Ecclesiastes 1. Listen to this. It's been crazy because Pastor Gary and I have literally, I'm like, he's still in my sermon. <laughs> but Ecclesiastes 1, listen, it says, the words of the teacher, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. So we're talking about meaning and purpose. What's the purpose of your life? I'm just talking today. If you just live with this little world as everything, good luck. But if you look beyond and say, God, why did you create me? Help me to be part of that purpose. That's what I want. But if you don't, it doesn't matter what you achieve. You can achieve more, do more, get more than anyone else, but don't have the right motive or the right why because behind the what and you will be empty, you will be frustrated, and you will be a total failure in the end. Even though you got to the top of the, the pile, you realize it's just a big trash pile. So let me read this to you, Ecclesiastes 2, as we kind of wind this thing down here. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 4 to 11, he says, I undertook, if you see on the screen here, you're going to see all the eyes, 
I undertook great projects. I built houses for who? Is it up there? Myself. Do we have anybody running? There we go. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and providences. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delight of a man's heart. This guy's just, I mean, he's got it all. I became greater by far, not just squeaking by, but by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all my wisdom, in all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. This is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life live to crazy levels. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward of all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So the last two weeks, we have literally had the same exact trip reverses in her. But he says, oh, you think girls are the answer? How about three? No, how about a thousand? You want a thousand of the most beautiful women in the entire world? That's what Solomon gets. Around three years, if he spent a night with a different woman every single night, three years, remind me of your name again. He's like, money? You talk about money? He's got people coming from all over the world. One's bringing him 666 talents. I think it was of silver or gold every year. It's like, it's crazy. Everything this man has and everything he achieves and everything he does and all the honor and respect and the wisdom and everything. And he says, it was nothing. Why? Because it was all about him. It was all about him. So what is your why? Noah's why was to save the world. That's why he was willing to, to look like a fool for a hundred years. If you've ever been up to the ark encounter and you stand there and think, if I just had to put the pitch on the outside, I would be here for the rest of my life. Why did he do that? Because he had a huge why. You are going to save the entire world. You're going to preach to everybody. and everybody, No one's going to listen to you. But it says, but he and his household were saved. And through his household, he started, you owe him your life. Because he had this huge why. Abraham. What was the why that drove him to go and be willing to offer his own son? Well, to bring about the nation that would bring about the Messiah. God had promised him. He says, listen, you see the son right here? You trust me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you as many children as there are stars are in the heavens. You are a fulfillment of that promise 4,500 years ago or however long it was that God was going to bring countless children through Abraham if you're a follower of Jesus. You're one of his children. What was Joseph's why? It was to save the nation that our Savior would come through. Moses' why? To deliver God's people from slavery. He says he was looking ahead to his reward. See, much of your power and my power lies in your purpose. If you don't have a big enough purpose, you're going to have no power. But if your purpose is so big and so grand that good God says, listen, I'm using you. I'm using you. I just told some of the boys today that I was mentoring, I just told them, I said, listen, you know what saved me when my love for Christ wasn't enough to keep me away from looking at things I shouldn't have looked at and doing things I shouldn't have done? It was the purpose that I knew that God had burnt on my soul. He said, Steve, you are going to make a difference in thousands of people's lives. I believe that from a child. And I knew if I mess this up, I don't just mess it up for me. I'll mess up everybody else that I'm supposed to impact. And you're supposed to impact people. A hermit, a hermit that thinks he doesn't impact anybody. The average hermit impacts around 10,000 people throughout his life. Why does a dude never come out of his house? But you impact people. We all do throughout our life. So Paul, what was Paul's purpose? He was bringing the gospel to the rest of the world, to all of us. He was willing to be 
I mean, you name it, whether he was stripped naked or whether he was out in the ocean, no matter what, how many times he had to go to prison and beaten and whipped and all this kind of stuff, nothing would derail him because he had this gigantic purpose. Why is the power behind every what? So, the what is, Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished. When he utters those words, what was the why? It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Do you know what the why was when Jesus says it is finished? He wanted to love his father, but he wanted to win you for him as his bride for all eternity. And so nothing would derail him because you were part of the why for him hanging on the cross, his love for you and me. That's the only chance that we have. So he would not, even if his own friend's trying to derail him and say, no, no, don't, don't, don't go, don't go. He says, get behind me, Satan. I set my face like a flint. There is nothing going to keep me from what I've been called to do. So when you hear, well done, good and faithful servant, what is the why behind that? Hopefully love is the motive that drives you every second of every day so that when you hear those words, that divine accolade that we should all be living for, hearing those words, good and faithful servant. God does not flatter. Matter of fact, he says he's going to cut off all flattering lips one day. And we're going to lose, lose the ability to use those if we, if we say the wrong things. I promise you, in that day, when it's judgment day, God's not going to speak like he did to Gideon, like we were talking about last week, and say, you mighty man of valor, right? When he's a big chicken. But he sees in the future. But now it's the day. You're standing before him. What's he going to say? Good job. You really stunk. But I'm just going to say that in front of everybody. everybody no, he is not going to do that. If he says, well done, good and faithful servant, you know why he's going to say that? Because you actually through his power and his grace, you pulled it off. You did good. Well done. You were good and you were faithful. You allowed my grace to come into you and to change you. And you walked in a way that was worthy of what I did. And so I'm going to commend you on this day right here. That's what he's doing on this day. So, my goal for us tonight is not just to learn about the importance of purpose, but finding it and living with it burning inside of you every moment of every day. That's what God is wanting. Each and every second that is slipping by is attached to eternity. What we do and why we do it has eternal effects, both consequences and rewards attached to it. Everything that we do. So God wants to do more than just challenge you tonight. He wants to change us. The sermon isn't about just information, but it's about transformation. It's about we would be transformed. So we might know who we are. I hope you do. And you might know whose you are. I hope you know that as well. And I hope you know where you are, Palm City. Okay. But the question is, do you know why you are? I'm Steve. I live here, Martin County, Florida. But why? Why are you here? Why are you breathing air right now? Do you know the purpose for what God created you for? It's extremely important. The Bible says this, Proverbs 19, 21, Many are the plans in a man's heart or a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Let me tell you something. I look at it kind of like this, like a big old ship going, and you can go and you can do what you're told to do on the ship, right? What is purpose? You can work for him and be rewarded in the end, or you might have freedom on the ship. But guess what? The ship is going here and it's going across there, and there's a day when it's going to reach the other side. And you might have been gambling all your money away instead of investing it like you should have or whatever the case may be that you were called to do. And here's the day that you answer. And this might appear like all the freedom. Oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. Let me tell you something. There's a day coming. There's a day coming. He says, my plans and my purposes will ultimately prevail. And if you align yourself with his purposes, oh my goodness, I can, you can't even imagine the joy for being locked around something that is eternal. 
and that you know that the power of the Holy Spirit is empowering you to do what he's called you to do. He's giving you the gifts and the talents, and you know that Satan has fought you so incredibly hard. I told you before that I drove for years trying to do what I was called to do, dry heaving in the vehicle, because I was going to have to get up and do what I'm doing right now, speaking. Satan tried to so crush that in me, thought I would never do this. So, Jeremiah 32, 19, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. God has great purposes. The question tonight, are you aligned with them? Are you aligned with his purposes? Dr. Stephen Covey, who is a a Mormon, I don't normally quote him, but uh, he tells a story that I want to share with you. Um, And he was saying how many years ago I heard this, where these natives were cutting a path in the jungle with machetes. And there's just, I mean, a slew of them out there, maybe 50 of these natives that are just going, whacking away in the jungle. And one guy that's over all of them, he climbs up in the tallest tree. They're supposed, to be, they're supposed to be cutting a path to this next city. And they just go, man, they're going at it. And he climbs this tree and he says, hey, you're going the wrong way. Screams at them, right? And he hears back, shut up. We're making progress. <laughs> they're going the wrong way, but they're going good. And that's what it can be like for all of us We can be just going, cutting a path, but God says, guys, what are you doing? You're storing up all this for what? For what? Put my kingdom first and everything you need will be added unto you. You can put the big rocks in first. Listen to this. His plans and purposes are eternal and unchangeable. I just want to give you the last few verses. Psalms 33 verse 11 but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Do you, the Bible says that God has put eternity in your heart. And there's nobody here dreaming of living, golfing, hitting this little ball around for 10 years, and then dying and being eaten by worms. Nobody is dreaming that. Because eternity is in your heart. You want to do something here that people remember you or will matter for eternity. And God says, yeah. I put that there because I want this to be attached to eternity and you get to be rewarded for everything you do here because you've found my will, you've walked in it in an empowered way and I reward you for everything I did through you. That's how it's supposed to work. So, Job 42 verse 2, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be forth. Telling you what, Satan will fight you tooth and nail to keep you from fulfilling. If I told you all the ways that I'm attacked every, before every single transformed, it's a, my wife and I just, <laughs> we just know it's coming, right? We know. Relationally, if there's any weakness at all in our family, Satan's going to, man, he's going to blow it up, right? Mentally, I'll be attacked. Physically, we'll be attacked. Financially, we'll be attacked in every way because he is terrified. But you know what I say? There's no purpose. God has called me and anointed me for this, and I'm not stopping. I'm not going to be turned back, and I know his plans will succeed, and so we can move forward with victory. Isaiah 46, verse 10, 11. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Do you want to be on the winning side? Satan's monkeying with everything, trying to pull everything he can to to mess up God's plans. He's like, you think God's up there biting his nails, freaking out? Oh no, look what he did now. Oh no. He's not. He's like, good try. The problem is I know everything and I see you before you know, <laughs> before the, I even created the world. He knows all, everything. So he says, my purpose is you're going to happen. You get to choose what side you want to be on. And if you want to be part of my plan, you can join it and I'll empower you and I'll reward you. But you get to choose. Colossians 1, 
verse 16, verse B, or B. All things have been created through him and for him. Why did I put that verse in here? Because you were created by him, through him, and for him. Your purpose is to delight in him and to bring joy to him, to honor him, to glorify him, to be used for an incredible purpose right here. Not that I would like I would use a pencil, but that your will would be involved and you would delight in being used and you would long to be used by him, to be put in the hand of the greatest writer and he writes you into his story and you get to be a vessel in his hand, delighting in whatever he wants to do because you know it's going to be an awesome story and you get to be part of it and he's the one writing it with your life. It's beautiful. Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that in all these things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called, listen to this, according to his purpose. If you're living for his purposes, he says, there is nothing Satan can do in your life that I'm not going to turn for good. So you can rejoice in everything because you're living for a purpose beyond yourself and nothing can mess that up. Nothing can mess that up. I'll work the worst of circumstances out for your good and my glory. I want to leave you with three last verses. I hope this expands your mind a little bit. We are for the praise of his glory according to scripture. Listen to it says, In him we were also chosen. This is Ephesians 1, verse 11 and 12. We were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Why? In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. You are to bring praise to God. That's the reason you were created. You would glorify God. Ephesians verse 2, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Listen to this. In Christ Jesus, why? Why did you do that, God? In order. Here's the purpose statement. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Like what? You ain't going to save Steve. Not that he says, oh no, I'm going to save him. I'm going to rescue him. Why? He doesn't deserve it. I know. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rescue him so that in coming ages, not just in this age, but in a coming age, can look back and it's going to be the, to the praise of his glorious grace working in my life and in your life. And he's going to stun everybody in ages to come through his grace right now that he showers upon us. And his grace is not just the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. It's also, listen to this, the unlimited power of God in the present to please him. So when we see in coming ages, you're like, there's no way. There is no way that this person could live like that. And you say, that's the grace of God. That's the unlimited power of God on that person that enabled him to do that. And people are standing in awe for ages to come. Last verse I want to give you, Ephesians 3, verse 10 and 11. His intent was that now, through the church, this is the church's purpose, listen to this, the manifold, I mean, it just, it just keeps going. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to who? To the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see this? He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this body of believers. I'm going to put my spirit in them. I'm going to call them my body or my church. And as I call them, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal 
my manifold wisdom, just wisdom on top of wisdom, on top of wisdom, on top of wisdom. Who are you revealing it to? To all the principalities, the powers, the authorities that are sitting here saying there's no possible way that these few little humans down here can defeat all of these fallen angels and all of these lies and all these doctrines of demons and everything. He says, watch my church. Watch my church empowered with my spirit. And I'm going to show them, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stagger the principalities and powers. If they will align with the way that I choose to live my life, I will humble myself and I'll be a seed that goes into the ground. I will bear so much fruit to them that in coming ages, the principalities and powers will have their mouth gaping open saying, you did that through what? These little hobbits? How did you do that? It's amazing. That's what God's purposes are for you. I don't know specifically what God has called every single one of us to, but I know he's called every single one of us. I know he has a purpose for us. The question is, are you saying, God, I want to be used for your purposes? Will you give me a willing spirit? Maybe I don't even trust you right now. Maybe I don't even want to. I'm so stubborn. But if you change my heart, he says, you have not because you ask not. So I want you to bow your head with me. I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to ask tonight. Maybe what I've just been sharing, maybe you just realize I'm not in the purposes that I was created for. I'm not living in alignment with those, but I would like to be. And so you just raise your hand and just say, God, would you show me your purposes and would you get me in alignment so that my life can matter eternally. Will you put your grace on me? Will you reveal why you created me through your word, through your spirit that comes alive in me as I just repent of my sins and ask for forgiveness and ask for you to direct my life so that everything that I do is for your honor and glory. If you want to just say, will you pray for me right now? I want to be in alignment with his perfect purposes for my heart, for my life. Will you just raise your hand right now? Okay, see him all over. Beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you for these soft hearts. It's evidence that your spirit has been going ahead and working. And Lord, I ask, I beg of you right now that the enemy will not be able to steal this seed that you have placed in each one of our hearts. God, I pray that our, the soil of our heart will be soft and that you will plow it deeply, that you'll get all the rocks and all the stuff out that would keep the roots from going deep and us bearing much fruit. Father, I'm asking you would bless every single person here with a spirit of wisdom and revelation that they can know the purposes and the very God that created them for those purposes, Lord, and the very spirit of God that wants to direct them and be their counselor and their empower, their helper, the one that comes alongside them and gives them that dynamite power inside of them to accomplish whatever you've called them to do. And all of hell will be helpless against those purposes because you are the one working them out through us. So Lord, I just thank you and I ask you that not one person on the sound of my voice through the internet or here or anywhere else, Lord, that hears this message will not fulfill what you have called them to do, but Lord, they will walk in ways that honor you and that they will fulfill every single thing that you've purposed before the foundations of the world for them to walk in. Lord, I pray that you give them supernatural wisdom and supernatural strength. Give them the grace that all of us need, Lord, to walk in what you've called us to. Please, I pray that you would silence the deceiver from screaming in our ears, Lord, through media and, and social media and all the different avenues, Lord, where he tells us, this is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to be. I pray that we could just silence all of those things long enough to hear your voice and that we would tune our ear to hear your precious, still voice. I pray even now, Lord, that you would speak to someone in their heart. That you would call them. That you would say, I love you and I created you for this purpose. 
and I'm calling you out tonight. Tonight is the night. Today is the day of your salvation. Walk out of the darkness into the glorious light. Walk out of your prison and be free. Free to what I've called you to. Thank you, Lord. I worship you tonight. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen.